there students, welcome back for another segment of Intensive Review. In this segment, we are going to continue our coverage of Reconstruction, uh, looking at USHC 3.4 that's focusing on Southern resistance to Reconstruction and the end of Reconstruction. So we're going to take a quick look there. Now this is a carpet bag, all right? It is a bag made of carpet. You just pull up an old carpet, you sew it together, you make a bag out of it. These, this is for luggage for people who can't afford real luggage, all right? Now, a lot of people came down south with carpet bags after the Civil War, and these were carpet baggers. These are people who were nicknamed by Southern whites, people who came from the North to the South. Now, of course, this is a, you know, somewhat of an insulting term that is applied by white Southerners to people who shouldn't be here in their views, all right? And keep in mind, there's kind of a carpetbagger stereotype uh, that is maybe sometimes true, but often not, not the case. So as far as the carpetbagger stereotype, you see this guy where it looks to me like he's got the bag that he came in with, and he's got the bag that he's leaving with, that this guy was just some sort of shyster or scam artist or something like that. All right, and this is kind of the view of these carpetbaggers that was present in the late 19th and early 20th century. But uh, anyway, as far as carpetbaggers, their goals really, you know, some of them may have come for power. Some of them came for opportunity. You know, there are jobs. What do you do? You go where the jobs are. Wealth, all right? Some people got wealthy. But then other people came to serve, you know, to staff schools and teach and that sort of thing. What we see here is a woman who is educating free men and women. Keep in mind that this is the first opportunity these people had for an education because this was illegal under the old, uh, under the old system. And in the South, the Republican coalition, all right, kept uh, the Republicans in power. This coalition was made up of carpetbaggers, also scalawags. Now, scalawags, this was a term applied to Southerners who had supported the Confederacy during the Civil War. And then, when Reconstruction happens, if you can't beat them, join them that they joined the Republican Party and cooperated with, you know, who the, a lot of the white Southerners saw as occupiers. Now, General James Longstreet, who's pictured here, was one of Robert E. Lee's lieutenant generals. And, you know, he just decided, well, you know what, I'm going to join the Republican Party and, uh, you know, cooperate and that sort of thing. So, a scalawag, this is something, if you've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, I think you've probably run into this term. It's somebody that's a scoundrel, a lowlife. Uh, criminal, that sort of thing. And then the freedmen who, during Radical Reconstruction, were able to vote. All right. And so what you see here is a great deal of resistance from certain segments of white Southerners in the form of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, you can tell these uh, in this cartoon here, these people that are hanging, we would describe as carpetbaggers. This guy's got a carpet bag. It says Ohio on it. This is somebody who came from the North. And this is the first Ku Klux Klan. Now, keep in mind that there are two clans, one during Reconstruction that ceases to exist once Reconstruction's over, and then the other clan that materializes in the 1920s. So the Ku Klux Klan commits acts of violence, and eventually, southern states, they are, t you know, taken back over by the Democratic Party, what you would call home rule, all right, that white southerners reestablish themselves kind of one state at a time, as you can see on this map. And by 1874, what happens here is that a lot of people up north are growing kind of weary of radical reconstruction. And there's this, this is Harper's Weekly, what I've got here, which is a Republican newspaper. So even a moderate Republican newspaper is putting out this, uh, this sort of idea that these states are subjected to colored rule in, uh, in the South, all right? That they're, you know, that the carpetbag state governments are corrupt and it's time to stop supporting radical reconstruction. Now, also, there was a bad economy, and the Republicans paid pretty big in 1874 in the election to the U.S. House of Representatives, that the Democratic Party took the U.S. House in 1874, which is going to lead to the election of 1876, which was a disputed election, and we see these people kicking around the ballot box. What happened was there were three states, South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana, that still had radical, re you know, radical reconstruction, still had, you know, small contingents of, you know, Union troops in the state, 
and they sent two groups of electors. The Republicans said that the Republicans won, the Democrats said the Democrats won. And so this is a disputed election. What ends up happening is that the Republican, Rutherford B. Hayes, ends up getting all of the electoral votes. In return, now there's never anything written down or anything like that, but in return there's at least kind of a tacit unwritten agreement that the troops will be pulled out of these states as well. All right, so the Union troops are gone and radical reconstruction is over and white Southern Democratic home rule is reestablished. And this is what we would call the Redeemer governments under people like Wade Hampton, who had been a Confederate general. And keep in mind the phenomenon of the Solid South almost 50 years later. And then there's Jim Crow. Now Jim Crow describes this system of racial segregation that existed in the post-Reconstruction South. All right, so Jim Crow laws, uh, typically talking about racial segregation, and also you could lump in the literacy test and the grandfather clause. Now the thing is that the 15th Amendment said you can't stop someone from voting because of race, color, previous condition of servitude. Now it doesn't say that you can't tell someone they can't vote because they can't read and or because they didn't pay a poll tax or something like that. So literacy tests and poll taxes. So when you think about Jim Crow, segregation, literacy tests, poll taxes, all that stuff. Now another thing that they did is they decided to come up with a grandfather clause which essentially said if your grandfather could vote then you were grandfathered in so to speak. You didn't have to take the literacy test. You didn't have to necessarily pay the poll tax or whatever. So you could make an exception here. And they still use that term. You'll probably be grandfathered into something sometime in your life where you were already part of something and because you were already a part of something you were not subjected to new rules. And so that nomenclature is still present in our language today. So keep that in mind. And then the Supreme Court pretty much affirmed Jim Crow and segregation and the grandfather clause and all of that kind of stuff, the literacy test. So the Supreme Court cooperated with, with, these, uh, you know, with these southern home rule governments that were disenfranchising blacks. And then there's Plessy v. Ferguson, which you'd need to know. That's in 1896. And Plessy v. Ferguson affirmed the doctrine of separate but equal. All right. And uh, keep in mind that Plessy v. Ferguson was overturned by Brown v. Board in 1954. All right. But this was about railroad cars in the state of Louisiana, segregated railroad cars. Somebody said, well, the 14th Amendment says that equal protection of laws, right? That everybody is equal under the law everywhere. You know, no state shall, uh, you know, abridge someone's privileges and immunities, all that. Well, Supreme Court says if there is a separate car, it's still, it still can be equal. If, you know, now if all the cars were white, then that would be a problem. So it's just like if, you know, we ordered pizza and there are two pizzas. Well, because I'm eating one pizza and you're eating another pizza, they're equal but they're separate. So keep in mind Plessy v. Ferguson, separate but equal, and then overturned by Brown v. Board, 1954. Probably shouldn't have used a food analogy. Now I'm hungry. But anyway, we will move on to 3.5 in just a bit, but first I think we need a coffee break. So anyway, hope you'll join us for the next segment. See you in a bit.